and we are started. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. It's a, it's very. I'm very excited to have you on. To <laughs> well, thank you, thank you for inviting me. Yeah, well, uh, we talked a little bit about um, some things before the podcast started, and I really want to know, like, who you are and how your, what your position are in game development. Sure. Uh, so I'm Chris Avalone. I have. Uh, worked in various games for probably over what I think is 25 years, which is makes me very old. Uh, I have worked in pen and paper games and computer games, mostly computer games, even though I got my start in pen and paper games. Um, uh, my most recent, well, I guess uh, some of my older projects are, uh, so I've worked on uh, Planescape Torment. I've worked on a lot of uh, Dungeons and Dragons games, like a lot of Dungeons and Dragons games, like a ton. Um, also, uh, let's see, Neverwinter Nights 2, Alpha Protocol. Uh, this is one of those points where you're, like, you're going back through your resume in your head and you realize yeah. there's been so many, it's, it's hard to remember them all. Uh, so uh, Fallout New Vegas. Plan, uh, uh, I currently, you know what, I, th I think I'll start with the more recent ones. Mm -hmm. uh, so I've... I worked on uh, Divinity Original Sin 2, uh, which was a great experience. And then uh, also uh, Wasteland 2, Wasteland 3. Uh, and uh, I recently uh, got to reveal that I'm working on Dying Light 2 with uh, Techland from Poland, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, no, I uh, worked on a whole ton of stuff. So much so, they're all weighing down in my brain right now. So. <laughs> So, um, speaking of Dying Light, did you have a great E3? You know, um, so this is going to sound weird. So, I didn't actually go to E3. Um, oh. And I wanted to, but uh, all the pre-E3 stuff, because uh, to do the, um, the... So, to explain to anyone listening, the... Uh, so we did a reveal for Dying Light 2 uh, during the Microsoft presentation uh, sort of before E3. Uh, and uh, that was uh, such an exhausting experience to prepare for it that I actually had no energy left for E3 <laughs> itself. So uh, about a day after the presentation was over, um, I actually just went home and started writing again. <laughs> So I, unfortunately, I did not actually go to E3 itself, and um, I just didn't have the energy for it because I am old. Well, uh, <laughs> um, did, 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 did you go to E3? Did, did anything pop out at E3 to you? Uh, well, of course, Cyberpunk stood out uh, as one yeah, of the... Yeah, I've, I've heard a little bit about yeah, that game. Yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's the... I've only the seen a few guys. trailers, so it's not, it's not clear what the game's about. And so on. <laughs> um, well, they they actually had the what the uh, they had the they had a hands on uh, uh, gameplay demo mm. there, didn't they? Because I, I, I mean, obviously, I saw the trailer, um, uh, and also I knew the CD Project Red guys were in the audience. So I'm like, well, they're probably here for a reason. But mm. the, and the weird thing was, like, by the end of the presentation, I'm like, there's still been no cyberpunk mention. That's kind of weird. And then, like, at the very last trailer is, like, yeah, yeah. Cyberpunk 2077. So I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> but, yeah, no, I, I think the trailer did a good job of setting the ambience for what you're probably mm. going to expect. And then uh, I do know some people got the chance to play it. I was I was not one of those people. I I shed many tears. But, um, but yeah, no, it, I, I expect great things. And, uh, you know, they probably have a lot of pressure on them. Because, you, know, you know, the Witcher, you know, Witcher 3 probably, you know, no one, no one's ever heard of it. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's kind of that game that you have to play a lot of games to, like, notice. Um, like, uh, for, for example, when you know Metallica and, oh, there's this other band called, <laughs> called Megadeth. <laughs> in in the periphery. <laughs> are, are you a heavy metal fan, Andrews? I am, but I I listen to. I have this mantra that uh, no input is no output. So I I kind of try to do a lot of things to spark my creativity. So I listen to all kinds of music, but mostly the heavy end. That uh, that is a great mantra, by the way. Um, so uh, in the um, programming field, well, at least twenty years ago, when I barely brushed programming, they had a um, 
expression called uh, a gigo, which is garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> but I, I, I try to make that a little bit more friendly and go, if you're not taking in a bunch of influences from a, diff- from a bunch of different sources, like it, it actually genuinely does harm your creativity. Because like one of the things we would tell designers is um, – if you only take your inspiration from video games solely, you're, you're probably actually hurting your creativity because you're probably just recycling the same ideas over and over again. Like if you're not hitting things from like graphic novels, uh, you know, books, uh, TV shows, movies, all, all these media have, have figured out techniques for telling story or communicating a certain idea that, you know, that's, uh, something that computer games could learn from. And um, if, if you only restrict yourself to one particular theme or source, you're probably actually hurting your creativity. And also, one thing I found too, I, I don't know if it's been this case, the case for you, is when you listen to different um, you know, types of music, uh, if you sort of like go outside your reading range, like, hey, what sort of magazines don't I read or comic books I don't read? Sometimes that can spark a new idea about something that you like that you never would have encountered before just because, just because you're, you're going outside your comfort zone. Hmm. Uh, I, I, I agree with that notion because uh, some song out there you haven't heard yet is, is your favorite song. Um, in a totally different genre than, that, than what you are listening to right now. So... Um, speaking of stories, uh, I want to focus on stories and what makes a good story in a video game. Clearly, you have had a lot of oh, experience in in this. Uh, what nope, can I say? Not, in this topic, I, 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 I experience with stories. I don't know if they're good stories, but I. <laughs> well, but yeah, no, they no. are critically critically acclaimed. <laughs> yes, those critics. <laughs> <laughs> well, how is a story? What is a good story to you? Uh, uh, let's do some some classic video games that like stood out to you to be like this great story. Um, it's a so, broad question. Sorry, no, I, no not at all. Um, so. Stories in video games are a little bit uh, different for me in the sense that um, I think when people think like, you know, you know, oh, you know what makes a great story, um, they actually think something that they're sort of either reading or sort of passively absorbing. Like, you know, when you watch a, you know, what, what makes a good story in a movie or what makes a good story in a TV show? Uh, that's different in a video game in the sense that I, I'm in a genre of role playing games where the whole the whole sort of direction for stories is that players participate in them and that they bring something to it or they take away something from it. That's not made that it actually may not be integral to the story. Like the, you know, the game master or the computer game is actually trying to tell. So that's one particular challenge in the sense of um, for a video game story, like you want enough freedom like in my opinion uh for the player to sort of tell their own story within that experience and then take something away based on that that's like important to them um uh so so strangely enough um i sort of favor games that sort of pre- sort of present a more sandbox approach We're like hey we give you a bunch of systems an interesting you know stage for you to play out on or uh you know uh, different options for how to use your skills or powers or abilities and then and then give the player the opportunity to go hey and here is the story that i tell using the tools that you've given me and um uh and I think that actually makes for richer video game stories because you know the the whole um, the whole heart of the gaming experience is kind of the fact that they are interactive, and um, you sort of are able to. Uh, this is good. I'm telling this terribly, but. Um, it, I, 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 I guess I guess the challenge for for video game stories is that. Um, there's certain different ways you can do them. Like, so first off you can do a very like um, directed experience where the player is going to experience all these events in a linear fashion. And everybody who plays the game is likely to have the same story experience. And, um, 
you know that can happen and like you know with with, uh, with japanese rpgs for example and there's there's nothing wrong with that they um uh, or you can have sort of more of the you know the, the fallout new vegas experience where there's clearly some stories that characters are telling you within the you know context of the game but then there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can just go off and do on your own and you can you know share with your friends and say hey here's how i approach this like here's the way I tricked this person into this, or how I use my thief skills to do this. Um, and then that becomes part of the story, in addition to the stories the game's sort of like telling you with the characters. And then there's like totally sandbox games where there's very, very little in the way of um, uh, an actual concrete story. There's simply a bunch of systems that you can simply you know use and, hey, well, you know, I'm gonna build this or I'm gonna do that. And hey, here's how my city turned out. Like, or, you know, here's how I survived this experience. And then that becomes your own personal story. For me, it's always been uh, what the player is going to bring to the experience because I find that players tend to share those a lot more often. I think the fact that they're sharing them sort of gives a certain weight to them in terms of telling other people, hey, this is the kind of player that I'm, I am, and here's the experience I had as a result of that. And I, I think that tends to be shared more than, um, than a more dictated experience. That was a very long answer. I apologize. It was uh, quite was, fulfilling. Uh, <laughs> Oh, um, by the way, I think I can hear myself uh, through your mic. So if you have uh, the possibility to put in some uh, some earplugs or something. Oh, sure. Let me try that right now. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. All right, testing one, two, three. Sounds great. And I can cool. hear myself. Good. All right, perfect. Um, so... When when you're a writer like you are, um, how do how do you as a writer keep keep developing like a new take on stories in or or, or you know like new NPCs that uh, uh, gamers can can encounter in a story? How do you keep it fresh in a sense? Well, um, so I've had the privilege of working on a bunch of. Um you know, a bunch of different franchises and also um, a wide range of different genres. So what, what will happen is even if I have an idea or a certain character I come back to. So, for example, um, I had a lot of uh, love for this character, uh, Ravel Puzzlewell, that I um, did for Planescape Torment. But then when I finished Planescape Torment, I discovered that genre, that, not that genre, but that... Um, that character arc still left me feeling like there was more I wanted to say with her. So um, I actually took that character and some of her uh, characteristics and moved her to Nightfield Republic to the Sith Lords. And I'm like, hey, what, what, what would it have been like if Ravel was in your party and constantly asking you questions or exploring the theme? And uh, what I found is the the fact that uh, every game is sort of set in new context, like you know, um, a character trying to express their theme through Star Wars versus D and D actually transforms that character quite a bit, um, and I think that because of that, uh, it's actually not as hard as people may think to actually sort of explore new facets of a character. Um, uh sort of new new angles for for a certain theme or direction like um because because planescape was a lot about a, like you know what kind of player are you and that was sort of like the underlying message for what can change the nature of a man and planescape torment which is the central question but really that was a lot about hey what kind of player are you in this universe like you know uh, if you know someone treats you unkindly like do you do you, mm. <laughs> How, how do you respond? Uh, like, what sort of alignment choices do you make? But um, then when you go to a more black and white morality universe like Star Wars, the context of those questions change. So I, th I think the, the way of keeping it fresh is usually just the, if I'm working in a different franchises, um, that franchise can sort of change the perspective on the question. Mm -hmm. And also change uh, how you build that character just from the ground up. Because, you know, um, a character like Ravel 
uh, and Planescape, you know, uh, you know, in a, in a fantasy setting is built much differently than say uh, a character like Kreia in uh, in Knights of the Republic too. So, uh, the franchise helps. Um, the other thing that helps is that the it depends what type of game you're doing outside of the story and the lore. Like if you're doing like a or like a real time strategy game or a role playing game or a first person shooter uh, or like a walking simulator, all of those things can change how you want to present a character be, just because of the mechanics change. So there's a lot of things that shake it up and sort of cause you to re- step back and reexamine how that character should present a story in those games. Do you find uh, inspiration in uh, in in real life events too, or is it mostly just game based? Um, <clears> it's <throat> a good question. Um, so while I try uh, never to use anyone that I know in the real world as sort of like templates for characters, and I, I've known authors um, in in game worlds and for in other media who. Who sort of lock on to people they've they've known, and they're like, "Oh, I'm going to develop, I'm I'm going to use that as a template for this character." I tend not to do that and focus more on: um, Is there a human situation that I've experienced that I think would translate well into a computer game? Because um, I feel like if you don't try and bring those real world connections uh, to a game or to a story experience you might be missing out on an opportunity for the player to take away something real um, from the game itself. And what I mean by that is, um, uh, so we were, we were doing the this game, Star Wars Knights of the Republic 2, and there was one particular sequence on this, you know, Smuggler's Moon, uh, you know, the uh, called Nar Shaddaa, where uh, the player can encounter this guy who's brought his family uh, to this, to Nar um, the, the guy you meet has made a lot of bad decisions. He's in debt. Um, and he asks you, um, Hey, you know what? Um, I could really use some funds to, you know, help my family get out of here. But as you, but as you talk to him in the conversation, you start discovering that he's made a number of bad decisions regarding money. And that's why he's currently trapped in the situation. Um, now the trick is, uh, you know, if you're being like a normal Jedi character, um, you'll actually pay this guy's debt and help him out. But if you do that, um, then your companion Kreia will then call it out and go, "You do realize that by giving this guy an easy way out um, and paying all his debts, he may actually never learn from this experience." and all the bad decisions he made to get here when in fact if you had not given him the money he may have had to actually work his way out of the situation and then learn from it more intensely versus you know you giving him this big safety net and um that's something that i drew from real life where i'm like you know what sometimes unfortunately like i've had friends who you know will will ask for money or ask for help and I, i will try and help them but at the same time I don't want them to lose sight of the fact that, you know, if I'm giving you an easy way out, if I am paying off this debt you had, I need to see some sort of change in you that um, that helps you understand how you got to this place. Mm. And by giving you an easy way out, um, I may actually be hurting you instead of helping you. And um, and then I, you know, I also apply that to my own life. Like, you know, were there decisions that I made that um, – that put me in a, in a bad situation and was it better that I worked my way out of it myself? And then, you know, no matter like how hard it was or, you know, would it, would that experience have not had the same learning message if I had not, um, uh, you know, if, if I had had the easy way out. And I think that in most cases it was, if you get yourself into a bad situation um, and then you fight to work your, work your way out of it, I think that ends up making you a stronger person for it. And, 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 you know, there a lot, there's a lot of like real life um, moments. I think that if you put in video games or any story, 
that I think players can indirectly learn from and hopefully like see situations in their own life from a different perspective. So that was a very long answer, but that's that's kind of my feeling on it. Mm-hmm. It's so it's 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 mostly um, your writing is mostly based on situations and and feelings that are like like the human feelings or or am I being wrong? Yeah, you are there. Okay. So, so, so you, you don't draw from like like historic events in a sense, or is it is it more uh, to like the, the the world building? Not so. Um, I do draw upon history in the sense that this is going to sound a little funny. Uh, I draw upon history in the sense that here's what happens when a bunch of humans get together and do something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this, and, and there are numerous, numerous examples in history of where this has happened and also in, in modern day life. And then I try and draw from that and go, you know what? These are the patterns I tend to notice when people try and do X, Y, and Z, mm-hmm. um, either as a group or when they try and head a group or, or whatever it happens to be. And then I try and examine that human drive in the context of the franchise and the world that I am working in. So if it's Star Wars, like, hey, how would that work in the work in the Star Wars universe? Or how would that work in Divinity, Original Sin 2? Or, you know, how would that human angle work in Prey? Uh, you know, all those things. Um, so it, it's taking from a bit of history a bit of observation in real life and then seeing it through the lens of whatever game world I'm working in. Mm. One thing that right, really makes a good game in my perspective is when the character you, you're playing is... Um, let's grab an example to, to, to make it just a little bit clearer what I'm saying. Is that, for example, Skyrim, when if I were a Nord and I was going to a place where Nords weren't welcome, uh, then yep. then the surroundings will like uh, hiss at me or spit at me or something. That's when you know when the the character interacts with cultures and the cultures differ in a game. That's when a game is really good, great to me. So my question is. <laughs> Is 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 your focus not on building cultures, or is it more uh, individual, in a sense? Um, well, it's both, actually. So, um, for a lot of games that I work on, we have uh, we have. This is going to be a long a long way to get to get to your answer, but um, we do these writing style guides where it's like, Hey, you know, here's how the characters interactions should be uh, formatted and set up. And we do actually have a culture section in those writing style guides in the sense that, you know, um, you know, so as you, as you just said, so if you're in Nord and you're in a place where your, your culture is not accepted um, and that's a clear part of the world background and the franchise background, it's very important for anyone writing the video game that that's being communicated to you as a, as a player. Um, and it's also being represented to you as a character. Uh, the, the, hmm, um, this is the example I like to use, but I call it the, uh, the, the dark elf syndrome and, and forgotten realms. So the way the culture for dark elves is set up in forgotten realms and probably a lot of, a lot of D and D worlds that use dark elves is that no one likes dark elves. Like they're like, Oh my God. Like it's like having, you know, the devil in your parlor. Mm. So if, if you're given the choice to be a dark elf in the game, the game should uh, give you uh, a sense of what's that like, what, what that's like in the sense NPCs should react to you in a different way. Like you are unusual. You are frightening. Um, they don't expect you to talk to them. Um, so and then the dialogue should should reflect that. And if it doesn't, you're actually doing the uh, the franchise a disservice because you're not communicating correctly what it means to be a dark elf. Also, um, in these writing style guides, we also make mention that it's very important that it, that if you encounter someone else of your same culture, 
you should have something more to say. We're like, so dark elves are rare, they're frightening, they're mysterious. But if you encounter another one as an NPC in the game, it's probably one out of a thousand you might meet. If you're playing a dark elf, you should have something different to say to this person that reflects the fact that they are, uh, you know, they're out of their element. Um, it's unusual to see them there. And also that, you know, you're, you're of the same culture. And um, I think that's very important for sort of establishing the reality of the world that you're trying to set up. And it can, it can take a lot of work. But I think it's important to do uh, for the sake of world building in the sense that it makes you feel more like if you choose that character class or that character race that you're that you're really there and that you're feeling that experience when you're playing the game. I think that's very, very important. Hmm. Um, I'm asking you this because I recently read a book called The, the Great Sleigh Ride and it's, it's not related to Santa in any sense. It's... Um, uh oh. <laughs> It's, it's this guy called Knud Rasmussen, and he was a Danish uh, polar scientist. And he went on a great sleigh ride, going from uh, East Greenland to Alaska in, wow. like, in, in 1912. <laughs> or, you know, in that era, I, I, I can't remember correctly. But he went, like, with dogs and, you know... Um, and he, along this sleigh ride, he was talking to all these Inuit, Inuits and Eskimos along the, along the coast and gather up, up all this information about how it was to be living in such a harsh environment. And if you want to read a great book, I'll, um, you, you'll have to read this. <laughs> um, so, sorry, it, it's Great Sleigh Ride? The, the Great Sleigh Ride? The, the Great Sleigh Ride. And one Got thing, it. one thing that really stood out to me, when you're living in in such a harsh environment, where food is so scarce that when a female child is born, you kill her because you can't use her in two generations. So it's really, wow. really, really, really tough in this environment. So that kind. Uh, we, we we were talking about how I get inspiration uh, in my work. So this book has given me a whole lot of perspective on things, how I am very privileged <laughs> in a sense. I have a computer, I can look on my phone and so on. But they have so little food that they kill the infant child to prevent starvation. It's very, very, it's a very good book. Um, All right, well, no, that sounds, wow, that's pretty powerful, geez. Yeah, it is. Um, I, sorry? No, um, the, uh, uh, okay, so one other thing is uh, related to what you just said is that um, the environmental factors uh, in a game, um, so sometimes, uh, and sometimes I worry that uh, some game writers don't always uh, consider this, but um, the idea that when you're sort of creating environments and landscapes, like for, for any game, the, the amount of direct translation that should have into how the culture behaves or how the NPC, the non-player characters, uh, um, behave in the game is tremendous. Um, so... The idea that um, uh, you should always factor in your environment and living conditions into how people uh, speak, like how they live, and almost all facets of their life, I think, is something really important when you're when you're doing world building. Um, like, for example, if you're living in a you know comp you know and a desert environment that shifts all the time, and like you can never uh, you know there's earthquakes or there's like uh, you know uh, sand sinkholes or whatever. Like like what sort of towns would be built in there? Like would you have towns? Like what sort of cultures would be? Um, would would arise from that like what's the hunting like uh, what's the food situation how do you how do you survive what would shelter be like all those questions i think create interesting answers in the world of video games depending on what the environment is and um um and and sometimes the answers can be quite shocking like like what you just said mm -hmm. uh 
and I think that's important for storytellers in video games to consider. Like, you know, what what is the daily life for people that live in this particular environment? Like, it's one thing to, you know, to, to suddenly see it and take it for granted, but then when you see the more drastic measures that people may have to resort to as a result of being in this particular um, environment that's been set up, I think that 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 creates interesting stories and interesting perspectives because it makes it makes you question your own perspective, like what you're saying. We're like, well, you know, I, you know, I I consider myself, you know, quite privileged. Like I, you know, I ask Google whatever I need to know, and uh, you know, I have a roof over my head every day, and food is not particularly that you know as I don't have to go hunting, you know, I have to go shopping, mm-hmm. which is almost as bad. But uh, but all those things sort of make you question your own life, and and I think in a good way where you're like, wow, I, you know, if civilization went away tomorrow uh (laughs) you know there are people that are probably more well trained to handle it than i can so anyway but uh exactly uh you kind of did my segue so thank you (laughs) oh Uh, to uh, like 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 the the environment bit because i think that's you know it's like you said the the everyday life and that should reflect the most when you go to like a random NPC out in the wilderness of some place. That should reflect all the way up to the dialogue on, on yep. why they are there and why are they going hunting? Is the is it the season for rabbits? Is it the season for salmon? Um, yep. So I think that should it should really be a core focus. But I am not in any way a game developer. <laughs> I just like stories. Well, no, I, so I, uh, so I, I feel the same way. Um, and and again, in these writing style guides that we set up, uh, we also tell people, to, the writers, to be very careful of metaphors, uh, mm-hmm. because there are certain metaphors that we use commonly day to day. Can you give an example? That would not apply to a situation like you just described, mm-hmm. um, and metaphors uh, within a game within a game environment can tell a lot about the culture um, that uh, I guess other metaphors being appropriate for like so we have this expression like you know penny for your thoughts mm. um, but but you know even saying an expression like that carries a lot of assumptions like you know hey are pennies the currency in this area like uh, uh, do people actually care what other people are thinking or they consider that rude uh, all those things um, or or oh, I'm trying to think of another example like um, I have one but shoot I have a Danish one <laughs> so so shoot. we have this saying that the when the cake in it so it's it's a horrible 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 translation. Um, it sounds in in Danish it is, it is like a kid. So things were messy and broken and so on. Yep. Beyond all, all repair, there went a keg in it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So, uh, but to ask, like, so why cake? Exactly. We Danish are very fond of food. Perfect. Yes. See, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but but again, like uh, so, like we do have that that uh, assumption with video games. We're like, like, what is that? What is this culture focused on? Like, you know, and the easy ones are like war and battle and other stuff. But the other things are like, if this culture is like you said, like, well, you know, we appreciate food, or we have you know variations on. Uh, you, know, you know, pastries or treats or, or whatever it happens to be, the metaphors when you're talking to that character, they'll bring that stuff up. Like, no, they, they won't hammer it home. Like, there won't be like a hundred of these things. But there might be one or two that because they casually say it as a comparison, you suddenly realize how important it is to their culture because that that sort of tells the story and how they compare events that take place based on their environment and what's happened in their history and things like that. And I think that's very, very important. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's also really easy to mess it up um, where you can, uh, you can take things from the the real world um, and then try and use them as metaphors in fantasy games. Uh, So one particular example was in star Wars where uh, (laughs) uh, 
the, I think it was the the Thrawn the Thrawn series in Star Wars, and basically the the anyway, I, I won't get into the whole background of it. But um, the point I'm trying to make is that when you encounter this one particular ship in this Thrawn series, it was called the Katana, and mm. um, the Katana is like then the Japanese blade, and and the intent was to make the ship sound like, you know, very sleek, very, like, you know, uh, agile, and also very deadly. Uh, what it did for me was completely take me out of the experience. Because mm. I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I'm in Star Wars that takes place many years before feudal Japan, yet somehow <laughs> there is a reference to the katana as the ship. And I'm like, that feels inappropriate mm. because that doesn't actually feel like the world that's been communicated to me. So I, I always asked uh, writers and designers to be careful of the word usage because like if they're doing like pay for your thoughts or, Hey, this is a Herculean task. I'm like, well, did Hercules actually exist in this universe? Like, uh, you know, or all those things, you have to be careful about the word choice you use and the ones that you don't use uh, in order to make sure you're communicating the culture correctly. And it's a, it's a really tricky road to walk because obviously we're so used to the expressions that we use in modern day life that we might need to take a step back as storytellers in video games to realize those may not be appropriate for an environment. Yeah, and, and you, you need to realize where these uh, metaphors came from yep. uh, in, in our world. It, it came from, you know, the, the environment, the setting in the likes in the in the game there's the the environment and and it it came from you know farmers saying things when they went out in the field yep um, and, and also it also depends on like what the farmers are harvesting like you know what sort of seasons are favorable yeah. to what they're harvesting uh how they harvest it like what what their hardest labor seasons are and what the easiest ones are like all those things yeah, you, you sort of need to examine in some degree of detail and then you build a language and a culture out of that because the food is so central to how these how these cultures survive that that you do want to take a hard look at it and it makes it more real when you actually um, um, uh, when you actually use those elements to inform how they speak and, and how they act like you know it, it's it's uh, it's it's very important hmm. so so we have all these elements now that need to like be put into a game but if you strip it all down to the bare minimum what is required to tell like a good story in in a in a game um player choice and real consequence as a result of that choice for me um not all games do this but i work uh I work on a lot of role-playing games, and in role-playing games, the the whole thrust of it is that you want to be playing a role, and you want the role to respond to how you're acting and the choices you make. Um, so uh, you want to make sure that you're giving the player in any situation uh, the ability to act in a way that suits their character, and this takes a lot of work. Um, you know, they may choose to be like, you know, totally random and evil, or they might choose to be, uh, the person that upholds all the laws and is, you know, uh, for want of a better word, a goody two shoes. They, they want to always do the right thing in any situation. And then they want to see the consequences and see some reactivity to that because that encourages them to participate in the world more in the sense that, oh, like I made this decision. And the world has showcased what the result of that decision is. And The Witcher 3 was pretty good about this, even mm -hmm. though the, the the decisions and sort of like uh, challenges you get are sort of very morally gray, which I like. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that ends up being more important because that, that makes you role play more because there's no there's no clear cut good or evil. You just got to get sort of have to examine when you're presented with a challenge like, oh, my God, how, well, I'm not really sure what to do. So what would me as a human being do in this situation or, or how, or what do I think would be the right answer based on the limited information I have? And I think that ends up making the choices and say, which are like a lot more interesting because you're sort of asking yourself more than what the game world told you, um, to make a decision. And, um, I think, I think that that's kind of cool. It is. Um, the, the Witcher is also a game that, that stands out for me to be like one of the greats uh, yeah. in in both environment but also 
I feel like dialogue is very well well written. Uh, yeah, so, that's pretty great. Uh, I I get immersed like when I put it on, um, I'm 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 in the story in in one second. Um, and it's really interesting because like in The Witcher, like uh, maybe you've had the same experience. It's just like uh, I feel like every quest and storyline uh starts off and then goes in a like just it feels like in a really surprising direction so like every person i meet i get excited about because i'm like i don't know where this is gonna go <laughs> but i know it's probably gonna be somewhere really cool <laughs> yeah exactly yeah, uh yeah. spoilers alert I'm, I'm 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 going to talk about the the pela mission if you know that one where you're going to fetch, that one. where you're going to fetch a goat to the sky because he has a goat called princess yes uh, <laughs> I remember that one. I loved that one. I love that one and too. That's, what, that, that, that's the one that you have to sort of make the noises to make the goat come back yeah, to exactly, you. Like, exactly. oh my god, that's great. And I was thinking, like, what is he doing with this goat? Yeah, <laughs> that also raises questions too. Yeah. I'm glad they didn't answer all those questions. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but that, that's that's one of the the great ones to me. Uh, I don't know if if you have like one of like the great games that you always remember. Um. Well, I mean, Witcher Three is 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 uh, is very much up there for a lot of reasons. I think uh, if I still feel the way in five years, uh, it, it'll be one of the greats. I, I I'm pretty sure it will be. The um, I mean, because there were so many good, like, and I felt like so all the quests you went on in Witcher Three, um, I felt like all of them kind of had this hook that was really hard to get out of your head. Like, uh, you know, there's, there's one, um, the Oxenfurt drunk where I'm just like, what is going on here? And then the whole gist of the quest is there's a vampire that, you know, actually prefers to prey on, you know, drunken citizens. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the kind of blood this vampire prefers. But I, it stands out to me because uh, because of that twist. Like mm -hmm. there's like, oh well, you know, it it has a certain selection of tastes in its prey, and then of course, like you as a character, in order to lure it out, you have to get super drunk and then walk around the the district until this vampire pops out. I'm like, that's a great quest. Like I, you know, it uses the uh, you know the intoxication mechanics mm -hmm. for for Geralt, and then like when he has it, like he starts singing singing songs in the streets. And people start yelling at him. I'm like, wow, this is this is like this is a lot of ambience and character to it. Mm -hmm. I like it, some good color, and I thought it was great. Um, the other uh, story that stands out to me was uh, actually uh, this is very very old school, um, but um, I really loved uh, both Chrono Trigger and Wasteland One. Uh, Wasteland One had this one sequence where you like you could uh, download yourself into an android's brain, and then you'd basically be in a game level environment, but then you, you used all your mental skills to solve everything. But it was still the same thing you did in the, the quote unquote real world of Wasteland with physical skills. So, so the way they did the systems for that was pretty great. And then um, Chrono Trigger, I always just loved because uh, uh, they did so many things that as a player, I'd never done in a video game before. I like, they would just, you know, they, they'd kill or remove your player character. And I'm like, Oh, I'm, you know, I'm going to get so-and-so back. It's no big deal. But then you start getting close to the end of the game. You're like, wait a minute. My, you know, main character hasn't come back yet. Like what the hell's going on? And, uh, and then like, there's a whole separate side quest line where you can go get, go get your player character back. And I'm like, what the hell is going on with this game? It's stuff that, it was sort of breaking convention and sort of like showing what the experience could be in a new light. And I, I've always appreciated that. Mm. Uh, one of the games I played, you know, Chrono Trigger and Wasteland that that's before my time. Um, I'm not that old, <laughs> <laughs> but, but uh, I, I played um, Final Fantasy before I understood a single word of English. So I, pl I played Final Fantasy Seven, and, uh, yep. um, and that uh, just the setting, and it, it was uh, my first. Uh, what can I say? It, it was my first real three D game on my PlayStation. Yep. So that had had right. like a, a very profound experience to me as a kid to to, to, I, to just uh, go anywhere. 
Yeah, I, I ended up buying buying a brand new TV just so I could play Final Fantasy VII mm. on the largest screen I could because when it came out, um, so I was working at Interplay during the time, uh, someone um, recorded all the spell effects to show everybody, and we sat down in various meetings and we watched all these different like abilities and uh, you know limit breaks play out, and the visuals just blew us away. They were like, oh my God. And this was up with this was even without story. Like and then when I started playing it, I'm like, wow, this is a fantastic game. Um and some of the system some of the ways they use systems to sort of um uh drive the story I also thought were very, very clever. And some of the twists in the storyline also surprised me quite a bit. And I'm like, wow, like, you know, I feel like, you know, <laughs> the, when when the U.S. tries to make games, we tend to kind of like stick to the safe spots. But the, the Japanese are well, well beyond us when it comes to creating interesting storylines. And then I'm like, wow, this is really brave of them to do this and this and this. Maybe we should branch out more and be more, you know, explore more because the, they do have a really good impact and there are things you remember so yeah no i final fantasy 7 was great it was and even though i don't didn't understand a single word of english i i really felt something when the when the girl died it was, she was killed by sephiroth i think it was yep um it was it was it was weird but um i kind of got it in a sense yep. <laughs> even though i didn't understood a single word uh, so the the art team, I think, and the and the and the the music guys did a, a really good job on that game. Yep. Actually, um, so and I I would also credit the system designers because when I mentioned systems before, um, so when you lose uh, Aerith in Final Fantasy VII, and I feel like oh, that's the, the name, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and when I feel like you, we've we've gone past the statute of limitations when it comes to spoilers. Uh, for this yeah. <laughs> anyway, but um, I what I did notice was, uh, you know how you have the um, uh, the gems you can place in the various weapons that you know, hey, wow, you know, you you can level up your gems to create different effects. Aerith always had the the weapons that allowed you to level them up level up more at the same time and i'm like well that's interesting uh, but then i realized that when you giving her equipment like that that makes you more likely to use your in your party mm. so that means that you're you're you know if you're if you're paying attention to that hopefully you will that means you're actually subtly guiding the player to choose Aerith as your party member uh and also it hurts to lose her when that event happens, like outside of the the general status of that situation, you're like, wow, Aerith was a good party member. She helped me out a great deal. I was attached to her, probably something like at least at least for that reason. And now it, she has been taken away from me. And I, I thought that the system designers actually had done a good job in making me sort of systematically care about this character beyond, you know, just the personality and the interactions. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was pretty smart. It's it's not just smart. It's really clever. I yeah. I, I haven't see, seen that before. Um, it also makes the um, it's, it's, it's not a good feeling, but the vengeance in a player to like go out yep. and, and kill this bad bad guy because he yep. he took away something precious. So he he has basically hurt your gameplay experience, yeah, yeah. and now you want to punch him in the face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't have a good segue for this, but um, I recently saw a video on 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 YouTube about Twitch ruining, uh, you know, the single player experience. Um, okay. But, um, as I said, it wasn't that great of a segue. <laughs> um, uh, how how did uh, the YouTube? Uh... Well, what was the argument for how it ruined the experience? The argument is that when people are watching a guy playing a single-player game, they won't go home and buy the game because they already, on quote unquote, played, uh, played okay. it through. But but I, sure. I, I, I don't think the word should be ruining. It should be that it's 
it's going to alter the the approach to, on how to make single player games. Do, sure. Do, okay. Do you follow? Yep. Yeah. So, what is your opinion on this? Um, I do think that if a single player game doesn't allow much choice or variation, um, uh, I think that there's an argument to be had there that's in support of what's being said. Um, however, I think if you're if you're watching a single player experience, like let, let's just take what I know about role playing games, and um, you're watching someone play through the game. And you see, there's a bunch of dialogue options. So the person chooses one that you wouldn't, but you did. But if it had been up to you, you would have chosen something else. Mm. And then you see a lot of specific reactivity to the choice that person selected. I don't think that would hurt um, your desire to go out and play it because then you're like, well, I would have preferred to do something different. And I can see if the game specifically reacts to this, so I would want to purchase it just so I can have my own experience. Um, but I, but I do get the argument in the other direction where there, if there's not a lot of choice, there's not a lot of variability in what happens. What you see is what you get. Mm. Uh, I, I can see where that argument's coming from. Yeah, I also think that, um, like Divinity Original Sin Two has like a vast array of different a lot. Path, paths to go yep. down on. So a streamer going down one path is not hurting. Like the sales, in a sense that, uh, let me just pick a railroad game. Um, was Life is Strange, in a sense, is is not railroady, but is uh, what can I say? It's that kind of genre. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah. So that game is hurt more by Twitch than Divinity is. Yeah, you know, although I, I think that um, with Life is Strange, it would it would depend on the person playing it mm -hmm. because uh, for me, for adventure games, because I, 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 I love Life is Strange, uh, I have a, a very particular way of playing those games that I don't think is very Twitch-friendly. Like, I go examine everything, every corner, uh, click on everything, and I think that would be really boring to watch, but I, this completionist attitude in me prevents me from doing anything else. <laughs> Uh, so that that might actually encourage me in the sense, like if if a, if a streamer wasn't doing those things, I'd probably be like gnashing my teeth and going, "Oh my god, you didn't check that one locker over there? Oh, that would you, you didn't check that one corner of the bathroom? Jesus!" Like unfollow probably, immediately. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um. So, I I think this is speaking of of um. You know, the Divinity Sin. That game was like, it stood out to me. Clearly. Uh, I, I haven't played the first one, uh, but I, I, have, I have a friend who played it and said, like, the, the combat experience is not that great, but it's, it's so and so. But get the, uh, the second edition, it, it, it blows your mind. And then I started playing it, and it just. Oh man, when I found out that I could place a totem in blood <laughs> and that changed the totem, I was like, no, wait. <laughs> 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 I can do that. The developers even thought of that. Uh, that was really, really cool. You know, uh, what I also enjoy is I feel like the, um, uh, the physics for the world uh, could have been quite complicated. But I felt like the way they implemented the systems, like what you're saying for the totem, for example, um, it feels really it feels really easy to understand when things like that happen, and it encourages you to sort of play around with the the combat mechanics and certain systems, and then you usually get the results that one surprise you, but two you totally understand why that would happen based on the context of how they've laid out the spell system. And I, I will say that um, I, I think Divinity was amazing about this. Like, there, technically, there's, you know, there's a huge horde of options you can choose from, but yet somehow it's really easy to wrap your head around it because it makes a certain um, 
it, it makes sense when things happen where you're like, okay, well now based on what I know about totems, you know, and the, you know, blood of certain creatures, I understand why this would happen. I just didn't think they would do it. And then like, but then it, then it does happen. And you're like, oh, right. Uh, the world, the world is consistent. So yeah, it's uh, the divinity systems, uh, even, even the first game and the, I thought were really well done where I was like, wow, I, it makes sense why I can use barrels of water to like, you know, uh, you know, to, to shut down fire tiles mm-hmm. and things like that. Like all, all, all those systems just made sort of logical sense. And I, that, that was one of the game's strengths. Absolutely. What were your, what was your involvement in, in, in that game? Um, so I, I reviewed the story quite a bit, um, and we had back and forth with the writers uh, on the game. And then uh, the creative director asked if I would do uh, the background for one of the characters in the game. It ended up being the uh, the undead character Fane, who uh, who was written by um, uh, Mr. Rooney. Uh, whose first name escapes me? I'm sorry, Mr. Rooney. <laughs> don't don't kill me. Um, I think it's Steve Rooney. There we go. Yes, Steve Rooney. Anyway, um, so uh, while he wrote the dialogue, what I did was okay. What's the important part about the story in Divinity? Like like what's what sort of the touchstones the player has to understand to get the most out of the story? Like, do they have to understand like what this particular culture was about? Um, they have to understand like a certain history of this culture or, cer- or a certain tragic event or a certain positive event. And then I try and design a character that's with you a lot of the time that can speak to that event. And I mean, he may have no idea how it's eventually going to relate to the story, but he gives you the context for what's going to happen when the revelation happens. And you're like, oh, well, I already... I see the importance of this because this character Fane was speaking about it. And I thought he was just doing things, you know, just one off about, you know, how he came to be like, uh, you know, what the undead are like, but now I see in a larger context, how important this is based on something that's happening in the actual game itself. And that's, and that's how I like to design care, design companions. Speaking of undead, um, and and Fane. Uh, when I played that that guy, you gain unlimited unlocks because you can use your finger <laughs> as, a, as a as a lock pick. That's, that's that's really really good. It's funny, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. great. It's, it's also very funny. Um, it's 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 a nice twist to put into a game that you. Yep. In every other game I played that required lock picks. Or, or, or that that needed something to open something else. You couldn't pick a character that immediately, um, what can I say? That immediately took out that mechanic. Yep. So. It, well, well, the nice thing is, like, it suddenly turns something you've seen as kind of a chore or sort of a given mm-hmm. in another game. Like, oh, well, you know, I need to have twenty lockpicks in my inventory all the time. Suddenly, it makes you pay more attention to that character because you're like, "Hey, this person not only subverted this mechanic, but now he's a huge advantage because I don't need to do this anymore, and I understand why." And then, like, like all all those things are a big win. So, yeah, that that was a pretty great decision. And also, he heals with with what is it, poison, compared to? <laughs> yep. Yeah, it, 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 it's very well thought out, and that and that's why that that game. Is 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 like above all the others to me. Um, well, Chris, I don't have any more to discuss with you to uh, tonight for me and this morning for you. Um, it was a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank, thank you so much for reaching out. It was a pleasure. So I had just been talking to Chris Avalon and that was a very fun experience. And if you want to have more fun experiences with me, then please go and visit my Patreon at patreon.com slash B-A-R-B-E-S. You'll find the the future um, people that I have on my schedule to talk to. And you can also drop by a comment. I will really want to hear what you guys think about this podcast and love to hear your thoughts about the topic I discussed with Chris today. 
So let me know in the comments what you guys think. See you later.